saying the child had a crooked penis. And I have a crooked penis. And I said, yes. She said, so how can you deny that this is your son? So she said, All I have to say is I hope nobody that. brought an exhibit. See, whatever, good looking. My okay, bad. we had sex. It was a three minute thing. You know, three, I, minutes. three minutes. Three minutes. You done come to the wrong courtroom clowning. This is not a joke. It's nothing to dance about. It's nothing to laugh about. Your future was on the line because of your bad decisions. Now, you should be ashamed of yourself. Mr. Taylor shows off his social media dad skills with a series of, look at me, I'm a dad, posts. But the plot twist comes when Ms. Orr tells him to delete those proud papa posts faster than a teenager hides their browser history. It's a classic case of, I want you to be the dad, but only on my terms. Right, Your Honor, that was on her Facebook. And then the next one says, love my son. Yes, Your Honor. And then the I... next one says, first time me eating him. Mr. Taylor, I will say this. The posts you put on Facebook, they look like you do want to be a part of this child's life. If you are the biological father, you intend to be a part of baby Eric's life? I've been here since, like, since I found out about him. Mr. I was not raised up with my dad. I did not know of my dad until I was 14 years old. I don't think any child deserves to grow up without dad. For the fact that she did not tell me until Eric was a week old, I am unbelievably shocked. I do not know why. This whole thing feels like a TV show gone wild. Here's where it gets sitcom level complicated. Mr. Taylor gets all mushy at the hospital, snapping pics like a tourist. Yet, Ms. Orr flips the script and gives him the stop sharing our baby's pics or speech. Imagine being told to share, and then, psych, don't share. You won't believe what's up next. You're at the hospital. You take these beautiful photos, right. post them up. What happens at the hospital that would make you retract all of this? For the fact of she had made me had doubt because she told me to take the pictures up her son off Facebook. Your Honor, she's basically harassed me that this is nothing but my child. I have known from day one, this is your child. She has messaged me constantly, this is your child. Why won't you answer the phone for your child? Yes, I And have. then you she put the pictures said, up of hey, your child and she tells you to take right. them down. Can't make this stuff up, Ms. Orr, in a move that would make soap opera writers proud, sends Mr. Taylor a babyface mashup, suggesting their son looks nothing like her ex. Mr. Taylor, now doubting his role in this baby saga, wonders if he's more of a guest star than a main cast member. Stay tuned, the next part is even crazier. Picture of a comparison that she had sent me of me. Let me see that, Jerome. And Eric. And another to Eric. That's you on the bottom right. That's baby right. Eric in the corners. Yes, Your Honor. And another man is on the top left. Yes, Your Honor. Why do you send them a collage of pictures with the baby and another man? To let him know Eric does not look like another man. Where'd you pull this man out of? Thin air? No, Your Honor. That is one of my ex. Your Honor, okay. that's the reason why I've been so, asking for DNA. Okay. And this is someone Mr. Taylor was accusing you of having sex with as well. This could possibly be baby Eric's biological father. Did they really just go there? In a plot twist no one saw coming, Ms. Orr claims their baby's unique physical feature should clear any doubt about paternity. It's like saying, he has your eyes and also, apparently, your crooked penis. Talk about awkward family resemblances. Oh, but wait, it gets weirder. Saying the child had a crooked penis. And I have a crooked penis. And I said, yes. She said, so how can you deny that this is your son? So she said, All I have to say is I hope nobody that. brought an exhibit. <laughs> Your Honor, my son could not get circumcised because he was over 90 degrees. Miss Orr, did you say that your baby has a crooked penis? And that was a point of proof. No, Your Honor, not a point She's of lying, proof. Your Honor. To let him know that his son is going to be having surgery in August. Then why was she at? Is that how you took it, Mr. Taylor? Why was she at? Just when you thought it couldn't get any stranger, the court calls in Dr. Richardson to debunk the myth that a crooked tingy lingy is the family crest of the Taylor lineage. It turns out genetics is more complicated than a simple bend to the left or right. And guess what? The next bit is the cherry on top. The grand finale reveals Mr. Taylor is. In the case of Taylor versus Orr, when it comes to six week old Eric Orr, it has been determined by this court. Mr. Taylor, you are not father. <laughs>
Ms. Myers drags her mom, Ms. Madrigal, into court, dropping a bombshell that her mom's memory of her biological dad is as clear as mud. She whips out a list of 13 possible dads, turning the court into a bizarre bingo game, hoping to hit the jackpot and find her real pops. But hold your breath, because the drama is just escalating. And if you think that's jaw-dropping, just wait for what's coming up. Ms. Myers, uh, you have brought your mother, Ms. Madrigal, to court today because you claim she has no idea who your biological father is. You say your mother gave you a list of 13 possible men and you are hoping to determine who your father is today. The court has located two of the 13 men and has already ordered paternity tests. Miss Myers, getting real for a moment, lays it all out, sharing her soul-crushing saga of not knowing her dad, sparking an intense mother-daughter showdown. They dive deep into the tear-jerking drama of who should have done what, turning the courtroom into an episode of Family Feud. Just when you think you've seen it all, the next moment will have you on the edge of your seat. The next chapter of this saga will definitely surprise you. I feel lost. You know, I feel confused. I don't know who I am. I don't know my heritage. I don't know what I'm completely mixed with. I don't know where I came from. I don't know nothing. You came from me. It doesn't family, matter. But that's only half Nobody the story. Nobody else matters. Can't no, only man, half the story. can't no man raise me better than you can, even though it doesn't even matter. You raised so me? Save, you raised me? Oh, I raised you. No, you didn't. I raised you. You weren't Monica, even there. Stop so it. Stop Ms. It. Myers, you claim that you left home when you were 15 years old. Yeah, I did. Mr. McCraney spills the beans about his fleeting meetup with Ms. Madrigal and his skepticism about his role in the whole Who's Your Daddy saga with Ms. Myers. This confession had the courtroom roaring with laughter, turning the solemn atmosphere into something resembling a sitcom scene as everyone pondered just how brief brief could be. But just wait, the plot is about to thicken even more. Stay tuned, because what happens next is truly unexpected. Get the witness for me, Mr. Keith McCraney and his daughter, Carmen. Oh, great. I cannot believe it. I... You do know Ms. Meyer's mom, Ms. Matt. Yes, I do. Please state how you met her. You know, we got together. She came over, told me she thought I was sexy, whatever, good looking. My okay, bad. we had sex. It was a three minute thing. You know, three, I... minutes. three minutes. Three minutes. Myers, feeling like she's the target of a roast rather than a court case, hits her emotional limit. This leads to a courtroom drama worthy of primetime TV, with the judge stepping in to play the role of a reluctant referee, urging everyone to get a grip and remember they're here to untangle the paternity pretzel, not to audition for a soap opera. The following twist in the story will leave you questioning everything. Brace yourself for the next reveal. It's a game changer. These guys, everybody's attacking me like I'm the one that was laying down sleeping with people. I'm the one that was made. Uh, Miss Myers, okay? I Look at me. I understand you're hurt. There's not a person sitting in here today that could imagine being in your position. Tell me what you feel. The moment of truth arrives with all the suspense of a season finale cliffhanger. Mr. Keith McCraney, it has been determined by this court that are the father. There it is. <laughs> Did you faint, Mr. Whoa. McCraney? I, I, I wasn't that at all. Whoa. No, I, they must have got their test mixed up or something. You are the father. Seat. The pleasantries exchanged between the judge and the courtroom crew are so warm, you'd think they were about to share a Thanksgiving dinner, not delve into the legal drama of Adams versus Williams. Just when you thought courtroom dramas couldn't get any more electrifying, hold on for what's coming up next, and trust me, you haven't seen anything yet. Hello, Your Honor. Hello. This is a case of Adams versus Williams. Thank you, Jerome. Good day, everyone. Ms. Adams, you say you're here today regarding a matter of extreme urgency. Miss Williams, with the sass of a daytime TV judge and the determination of a mom on a mission, counters, asserting Mr. Adams is indeed the biological father of her three-year-old son, who, according to her, has inherited his dad's inability to put the toilet seat down. She criticizes Mr. Adams for his absence in their son's life, noting that even a cactus requires less attention but somehow gets more from Mr. Adams. You won't believe the twist that's about to unfold. The courtroom is about to get even more heated. Just you wait. You say Mr. Adams is indeed your baby biological father and you argue his legal issues are his own fault because he never stepped up for his son. Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Adams is joining us from WBSF 46, the CW in Flint, Michigan, and we'll hear from you in a moment, sir. The court then hears from Mr. Adams's mother, who, armed with family photos and a tone that could guilt trip a saint, outlines the legal and emotional turmoil tearing through their lives like a tornado in a trailer park thanks to the paternity dispute and looming child support obligations that could rival a small country's GDP. But the drama doesn't stop there. The next segment will have you on the edge of your seat. The tension mounts, and what follows is truly unprecedented. Your Honor, my son is now facing jail because of this situation. This very moment, you're concerned that he could be arrested for failure to pay child support yes. for a child that both of you have doubts is even his child. True, Your Honor. 
As the tension escalates, the courtroom turns into a soap opera set with personal accusations and defenses flying faster than insults at a family reunion. The emotional and legal stakes couldn't be higher if they tried, including missed DNA testing opportunities that have everyone wondering if Mori Povich might just pop out to lend a hand with his infamous paternity test results. Believe it or not, what happens next is even more jaw-dropping. Prepare to have your expectations shattered in the next scene. The Adams, did you go to court? No, Your Honor, only due to the fact that I was incarcerated, so I didn't receive any court subpoenas, anything, Your Honor, I was incarcerated. I guess they were supposed to meet or whatever, and she must have met up with some guys. That's a lie. And she and my daughter was talking, and the question came up again, was my son the father of the child? And she said no, and she's over there talking about it's a lie, and she was in my very own living room, and I seen her. She was with a guy. She was around nine months pregnant. The episode deep dives into personal testimonies and confrontations, reminding everyone that proving paternity is trickier than navigating a corn maze blindfolded. The spotlight on the impact of personal decisions on legal outcomes shines brighter than a neon sign at Vegas, emphasizing the emotional toll on all parties involved. It's a roller coaster of emotions, with the child's well being and identity hanging in the balance, making everyone question their life choices and why they didn't just stick to watching cat videos on the internet. You'll want to stay tuned because the conclusion is something no one saw coming. But wait, there's more. The final revelation is just around the corner. I don't Mr. Know, Adams, when you look at Baby John, do you see yourself? I mean, honestly, no, Your Honor, because you know, I spent, ch I spent time around this child. If he was really my son, Son, you know, I think we had that bond, that connection. It has been determined that Mr. Adams is not the father. <laughs> Take me off child support, baby. You done come to the wrong courtroom clowning. <laughs> this is not a joke. It's nothing to dance about. It's nothing to laugh about. Your future was on the line because of your bad decision. So Judge Lake dives into the deep end, asking about the beginnings of Ms. Hanger and Mr. Babbitt's are we or aren't we relationship saga, including a cheeky check on their commitment level and, ahem, protective measures during their romantic escapades. Ms. Hanger spills the tea on how their love story was pretty much like a rom-com, minus the comedy, meeting through a roommate, bonding over video games and music, and eventually taking the plunge into intimacy, all with a carefree, read-protection-free spirit. Meanwhile, Mr. Babbitt throws a curveball, suspecting Ms. Hanger was also playing co-op mode with the other roommate thanks to some awkward comments and jealousy vibes. Picture this, a love triangle drama unfolding with video games as the backdrop, and you've got yourself a Netflix special in the making. This relationship began, was it committed? Were you also sleeping with other people? I met him through my roommate. He'd hung out a couple of times, played video games, listened to music, all that stuff, and then everything went on from there. So the bottom line is you two were intimate. Yes. At some point. Yes. Did you use protection? No, never. When Ms. Hanger drops the bomb about being pregnant, it's like the plot thickens and we're suddenly in a daytime soap opera. She's all in, swearing Mr. Babbitt's the only player in her game for the past year, but he's on the fence, giving side eye to the pregnancy test she presents. Cue the dramatic music as Mr. Babbitt demands a retest, fearing some ghetto hood rat stuff, which is his way of saying he wouldn't trust a pregnancy test unless it was done under lab conditions, or perhaps by a team of scientists. It's like watching a tennis match of accusations and disbelief. Only the ball is a potential baby, and the players are not quite ready for the grand slam of parenthood. When you found out you were pregnant, you told Mr. Babbitt because that was the only person you were sleeping with? Yes, I had not slept, slept with anybody else to him for a year with my ex-boyfriend. So you had never slept with I anybody had else but Mr. Night Babbitt stand. during that window of Mine. time? Well, you were sneaking out in the middle of the night doing something. Not sneaking you out. Can't you can't crawl the over me and not get out of me bed up. to go to the bed. Yes, and you wouldn't come back for an hour. No. So you would no. be asleep and then she would climb out of the bed and not come back for an hour? Yeah. I mean, sometimes 30 or 40 minutes, but it's a long No. And that's when you thought she was also she was, with the roommate. That's, and that's yeah, because I start piecing together. I'm like, well, he said no. this, but that could have been a past relationship thing. Fast forward to a medical appointment that feels more suspenseful than waiting for the season finale cliffhanger resolution of your favorite show. Mr. Babbitt's already packing his bags mentally when the heartbeat plays hard to get on the monitor, convinced the pregnancy is a prime time sham. He jets off, missing future appointments and the birth, effectively ghosting Ms. Hanger and his unborn child, like a bad Tinder date that went too far. Imagine Mr. Babbitt on a plane, sipping a tiny beverage, pondering the mysteries of life, while Ms. Hanger is left starring in her own one-woman show titled Maybe Baby. I went to the doctor's appointment with her to get the ultrasound done. They're sitting there, they're doing this ultrasound, and the nurse is sitting there, okay, we're gonna find that heartbeat. And then the nurse is kind of going over her stomach. It wasn't an ultrasound, it was a fetal Doppler. Two different things. Well, anyway, it's supposed to detect at six weeks and you're seven and a half, and the nurse told me no, so that was my medical. She's, wait, let me get this. So 
when you were at that appointment, Mr. Babbitt, and it was hard for her to detect a heartbeat, at all. you said, she's not pregnant. Yes. And then that's why you went on ahead and went out of town, because in your mind, you I thought it. there was no pregnancy. Well, but for one, I am a bigger, I'm a, I'm a bigger lady. It does take a little bit harder to detect things when you're a certain amount of weeks pregnant. You were there by yourself. Mr. Babbitt was not there? No. All right. This is a Did girl you let him know? Did yeah, you... I let him know. I had to go get induced. Yeah, you're um, like, I'm and then I got tonight. Tonight. Wait, no, I'm not. In court, the drama unfolds like a telenovela with a twist of Maury Povich, complete with emotional breakdowns, family betrayals, and the kind of paternity drama that would make even daytime TV blush. Evidence flies across the courtroom like confetti, from sassy letters to family testimonials, all aiming to untangle this messy web of who's the daddy. Amidst the chaos, Judge Lake decides it's time for a lie detector test, because nothing says I might be the father, like sweating bullets over a machine that's seen more drama than a high school prom. And just when you thought it couldn't get any weirder, accusations of baby stealing and Facebook shenanigans throw us into a loop, proving life is indeed stranger than fiction. Royce Babbitt, the defendant, he writes back, that's great, maybe they have you committed, cause you have to be crazy if you think I'm coming up there for a baby I don't believe is mine. Because I never proved to him that I was pregnant. No, what I thought could have happened is as crazy as you are, you might have been up there doing something in the hospital, not pregnancy related. A hospital bed, I had a cesarean. I had an emergency C-section the second time I got induced. Up until this point, from the time you went to Florida until the time you had this baby, you all weren't speaking, he wasn't involved? No, we started semi-talking on Facebook only to come over to my house to talk in person. Yeah, I walked in and there. And that makes like, you I emotional. Why, why, what why are you feeling emotional, Miss Hanger? What are you feeling? <laughs> that my daughter has to go without her father because I went through that. The big reveal of the DNA results is like the season finale, where all is finally revealed. It has been determined by this court, Mr. Royce Babbitt, you are her father. Wait, huh? All I want is an apology for her. I don't owe you any apology. Definitely you owe me an apology daughter, for denying Royce. her. Come on, dude. It's, I've it's told you child. from day one. Yeah, it's my child now, but it wasn't then. I mean, I can't. It's my child since conception. All right.